In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to be talking about real survival with no food, the best rivers for paddling and wild camping, banking fires for the next morning, cat tourniquets and doing the bow drill standing up. Welcome, welcome to episode 70 of Ask Paul Kirtley with me, Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions on wilderness bushcraft, survival skills and outdoor life in general. And I'm back in the south of England, back in the lovely woods of the south of England, and it's feeling a little bit more mild. And I think this is the first Ask Paul Kirtley in a long while that I've not worn a woolly hat or a warm hat of some description. It's actually quite pleasant out today. So without further ado, let's get on with the questions. First question is from Matt and this is via Twitter and he asks, Hi Paul, have you ever done real survival starting out with no food in your backpack? And if so, what did you experience? Um, well, one, one thing I would say, and this might be a matter of semantics, I know Twitter is, you've only got a short number of uh, words you can use on Twitter. Um, I would say that any, anything where you intend to go out and do something um, is a training exercise more than a real situation in, in that sense. Um, um, so it's worth having that distinction in your mind to start off with. Of course, training can be very realistic, particularly if it is coordinated by someone that isn't taking part in the exercise and is setting the boundaries, setting the rules, making it difficult perhaps in terms of what you are and aren't allowed to do. And of course, when you do those exercises, it's worth sticking to those rules because if you, you know, any, any sort of exercise, there may be a way of cheating, you know, burying Mars bars the week before or whatever it is, but there is there's very, very little point in cheating on those sorts of exercises because you don't learn the full amount that you can learn from that experience. And so, yes, I have done um, exercises where I have gone out with no food and then sought to, to live from the land, albeit for a, a limited period, you know, not weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, but yes, long enough to start to feel um, that that could be possible. Um, because in some ways it's that first bit, if you're talking about survival situations where all of a sudden you're in a situation where you've got very little um, in terms of food, caches, established shelter, established routines, established economy, if you like, in the natural environment. That's your typical survival situation where you've gone from being, you know, well fed, warm, satisfied, you know, whatever scenario that you'd like to think up uh, along the way. And there are lots of them, you know, you can draw from reality, the things that have happened to people um, whether it's plane crashes or canoe capsizes or vehicle breakdowns or a member of the party's injured or somebody losing a backpack on a river crossing or lots and lots of situations you could come up with where okay now I've, I'm left with what I have with me I don't have all the things I would like how do I uh, survive until I'm rescued until um, we can resolve the situation ourselves, you know, whatever the scenario you'd like to, to train. And people do train for different scenarios, of course, because training helps, training is important. So while these situations are not real in that sense, um, the training for a potential real arduous situation is valuable. And um, one of the things a lot of people have is a romantic idea about just being able to go and live off the land. Um, 
in a lot of places that's very difficult. Even if you're quite skilled, if you're just inserted into an environment with no water, no food, no shelter, um, very little equipment, it's hard to, you have to stand up on your own two feet. Think of it like you've just landed flat on your face and you have to get up on your hands and knees and you have to get up on your feet. And once you're up on your feet, you can start doing more. And in a way, that's what your first few days are like in those sorts of situations where, you know, if, if you were dumped into this environment or this type of environment, sort of northern temperate, for example, and yes, I'm not far away from habitation. There are, there's an air, airport, 30, 40 miles away from here, you can hear the planes going over. Um, you wouldn't be surviving in this situation, but you could be surviving in this type of environment and you could be surviving in this type of environment at this time of year. Um, there isn't a huge amount of food around, just lying around. Like, you know, certain times of the year, there's berries, there's nuts, there's um, tuberous roots that are easy to find. There's lots of things you could eat before you start looking at animal foods and you know it's probably the plant foods that you're always going to turn to first in most most environments um, but there isn't a lot at this time of year I'm recording this towards the end of March and it'll be going out probably early April this episode and around about this time of year sort of early spring there's not a lot of food around um, your priorities are going to be shelter uh, initially protection from the environment is you know as long as you haven't got any sort of medical issue to deal with or injury protection from the environment is going to be your initial um, that's your clothing that's your um, shelter that's fire and in terms of getting a shelter even a, a, a rudimentary shelter and a fire going and some firewood in to stay warm overnight that's quite a lot of work for your first day out as it were and you know when we run courses say on our intermediate course we have people do that exercise where okay guys you've got two things to do today you've got to build a shelter that you're going to live in for the week and you've got to light fire by friction um, using probably bow drill um, because that's uh, the most widely applicable technique and um, you don't have any hand drills prepared etc etc so you know fire by friction probably bow drill and a shelter that's your job for today um, that's tiring yeah because you can't purify your water until you get fire going um, if you're just boiling and so you've got to get your fire sorted, you've got to get water on, you've got to get firewood in, you've got to build a shelter, you've got to thatch it, you've got to make beds perhaps, um, and you have, or even just rudimentary beds, and you have to have some firewood to stay warm overnight, because even though it's quite pleasant, it's going to be cooler again at, at night. It's probably going to be 10, 10 degrees cooler than it is at the moment. Um, it's up into the sort of, you know, maybe towards 14 degrees today it feels like, but it's going to be back down to about four or five overnight. And so that's quite cold and lying around in just your clothes and those sorts of temperatures is quite chilly. You need a fire. So just getting that done and you're not going to get any food. And, you know, most people get grumpy if they miss a meal, you know, um, you know, if people don't have lunch, if you just have breakfast and you don't eat anything all day, people get grumpy, people get slow, people slur the words, people make decisions much more slowly or fail to make decisions. And one of the, one of the valuable things about doing exercise is where you also don't have food. Um, it's not something, we don't do that on the intermediate course that I was talking about. They do the fire, they do the shelter, but they've got food. But if you do that when you don't have any food, it's that much harder. And then the next day you're starting empty and then you've got to maybe start thinking about food. Um, and then you might not find very much initially. And so, you know, being able to just operate for several days without very much food, with a, a low glycogen in your system, is a valuable experience and one that most people don't have. And as I say, they have, and, and I was the same, you have this sort of rose tinted, like I know edible foods, I know this, that and the other, and I, you know, I can, I can fish, I can hobo fish, and I know how to set a snare. But then when you actually go out and do it, when you don't have any food in you, it's that much harder. Um, and so those exercises are extremely valuable and that's one of the things um, if you listen to the podcast I did with Joe Robin a while ago we talked about those sort of exercises where you go out and um, don't have any food and you have to live from the land and how that makes you feel and you, you know whether it's just you know I remember one exercise I was doing where I had, thump I had a thumping headache and it was probably a combination of dehydration, uh, tiredness, smoke inhalation in the shelter, lack of caffeine, um, low blood sugar, 
and it was highly unpleasant and then I got an upset stomach um, probably just because I was having a lot of liquid and a little bit of plant food and not very much else and um, yeah you've got to deal with all of those things while trying to get your own food from the environment um, it's it's tough um, and of course as you improve as I say it's like light you're flat on your face and then you get up on your on all fours and then slowly you stand up on two feet and so as you improve as you know two three four five days in you, sh you should have a shelter you should have a fire your shelter has been improved you're starting to get food you're starting to know where to find it you're starting to tune in on the, the resources that you can get in that environment maybe you've got some snares out maybe you've got um, some fishing uh, stuff going on you start to get some food in and then you start to improve because if you just stop you're just waiting to die basically so in reality and you have to go through those exercises with that mentality. I've seen students on courses many years ago, I remember running a course probably about 10 years ago where there were three guys in a, in a group and two of them really were just waiting for the end of the week. They knew that the course finished on Saturday, um, they couldn't really be bothered to go and find any food, they were just lying around in the shelter um, and of course they went home on Saturday but the you know one guy was trying his hardest but clearly he couldn't carry the load for the other two the other two weren't really doing very much and they got more and more despondent um, and and just sort of went into a bit of a circle of uh, you know just um, just sitting around waiting and you know in reality had they been in that situation where they weren't rescued if you're thinking of it in that sort of terms they'd have died because they weren't getting them, themselves any food. Um, they didn't really learn anything about finding food or learn, have any data points in terms of what what made them feel better when they were really low because I, I you know I remember just having a few sweet berries just a few blackberries just made me feel so much better. I remember making a cordial out of elderberries and, and fruit on one exercise um, and some other fruits and just sort of drinking that hot in the morning and that just perked you up so much more than it would do on a normal day you know when you when you're just out and about in the woods but because we'd had so little food and because our senses were attenuated it just tasted so good it made you feel so good and I remember eating beech nuts as well as we were out foraging for food just getting a few beech nuts and shelling them and getting them into my system even the pith of rose bay willow herb fireweed um, that tastes you know it, it tastes something like between melon and um, cucumber uh, similar consistency there's a bit of sugar in there just scraping that out the center of the the, the stems of uh, those plants and getting that into our systems just as a bit of a snack just you just feel the benefit straight away and you can think more clearly you can keep going for longer um, and that was really really good but just having those experience of knowing what it feels like to be dehydrated knowing what it feels like to be tired hungry because the other thing that's going on as well if you're in those sorts of situations is you're not getting your eight hours und undisturbed sleep uh, by any stretch of the imagination. You wake up cold, you get the fire going a bit more, you go back to sleep, it's nice and warm, you wake up with smoke in your face, you're uncomfortable, you've got a lot, you know, you've got a, a, a stump in your side or a root or the cold starts coming up through your bed because the first night you haven't really been able to make your bed as well as you would like because you ran out of time. All of these things, you know, you're tired, you're hungry, you're dehydrated, you're trying to find the food, but that's a valuable, valuable experience. And if you want to do that sort of thing, I would recommend you do it in some sort of controlled um, way. Um, yes, once you've got more experience, you can go out and do that on your own. And I have done that on my own. Um, and it's a great thing to do where you just, I'm going to go to the woods and I'm going to take a few things and yeah, you can tap out whenever you want. You can say, well, you know, I, you know, a few days in, you can say, right, okay, I've got what I wanted from this. But it's really nice just to go out into the woods um, take a few rudimentary, you know, your, your knife and your saw and a few of the bits and pieces and just go, right, okay, well, let's see what I can do for the next few days. That's a really good um, enabling thing to do at some stage once your skills are up. But do bear in mind that you make more mistakes when you're tired, when you're hungry, when your blood sugar gets down. You see it even with people, you know, getting close to lunchtime with some people. They haven't eaten for, you know, four or five hours since breakfast. They get a bit, you know, a bit blurry mentally um, and that's you know even just working in an office or something you see it with people working outdoors as well that they start to slow down they start to you can tell that they're thinking really hard about things 
I see it more in the cold when you're working in cold environments at the end of the day and you're setting up tents and you're getting firewood in, you know, might be setting up a heated tent for example, you can see the person in the group that's slowing down, that's maybe got low blood sugar, and if you've got a snack, you can give them give them a snack because then they, they come back up and they work at the, the speed of the rest of the group. Decisions are made quicker, things are done quicker, and you all get in quicker. Um, of course, if you've got no food, then that you, you have to deal with that ebbs and flows. And some people will have moments when they really need to sit down and have a rest, and other people will have, uh, you know, they'll have good energy at that time, and then other times it'll be the other way around. So when you're working as a group, you have to accommodate the fact that some people are going to be up when other people are down, and so on and so forth. And if you're on your own, you've got to be really careful because it's easier to see in other people than it is to see in yourself. And if you're impaired, you start misidentifying foods, you misidentifying plants, misidentifying fungi, those are mistakes that you don't want to be making. So initially, if you can do those sorts of exercises where you've got somebody who's like a safety marshal, not breathing down your neck all the time, there are ways of doing it, just you forage things, show them first. They of course have to have good wild food knowledge as well. Remember, if in doubt, leave it out. That's the most important thing. Um, and do it in a way that you're not just asking them, you know, can I eat this, can I eat this, can I eat this? Go out thinking, right, okay, well, I think this is this, I think this is this, I think this is this, I can eat this, I can make a tea from this, I can add this to a stew, we can roast these seeds, whatever it is, take them and then show them to this other person who's got equally good knowledge, if not better knowledge than you, and get them to double check. And they're not doing the exercise with you, they're being well fed, they're being well watered, they are your your safety marshal as it were, and then the people who are doing the exercise can have those ups and downs and lows. And if you make a mistake, then you've got a safety net. Um, it's a learning experience, it's a training experience. Um, you could have a forfeit, you know, it doesn't have to be a cost-free mistake. It could, it could be a forfeit where you have to give something up. Um, you might have to give up your woolly hat or your knife or your saw or one of your snares or, or something that you've got with you that is going to be something of an impediment if you don't have it. Maybe you have to give that up if you bring in a, a poisonous uh, mushroom that you think is an edible one. That's much better than eating it. Um, and so you can play those sorts of games and make them quite realistic and, and have consequence to your decisions, but do it in a way that you're not going to come to physical harm. So, yeah, I would recommend that you do that if you can, but do be very, very careful with... Um, just going out with the idea of going out and living off the land if your knowledge particularly of the of the plants and the fungi is not as as sharp as as it could be um, really make sure you've got that stuff sharpened off and then go out and apply it and it's a great thing to do it's a really it, it, you really feel like you've you've broken free of something when you can just go into nature and be all right you know be fine in terms of shelter and fire and food uh, and water of course um, it, it's a fantastic enabling feeling so I would thoroughly recommend it quite a long answer but a good a good topic of discussion and I will I will link to some um, articles that are relevant to foraging and there's a nice mnemonic that I came up with you reap um, that is useful to know in terms of what foods to go for certainly initially um, I'll link to that below the video wherever you're watching this if you're watching it as a video and if you're listening to this as a podcast just go to paulkirtley.co.uk forward slash ask paul kirtley 70 and you will go to the page where the video and audio for this podcast is as well as all of the links any other links that I mentioned they will also be there all right another question from Dave via Twitter and he asks what are the best areas or rivers for kayaking and wild camping in the UK not white water okay um, well that's quite a broad question really um, you say rivers yeah, I mean, the thing is, a lot of rivers in the UK, if you're considering them from start to finish, will have some moving water on them. Um, we're quite a small island, and most of the rivers from source to sea are not very far. Um, some of them can be quite steep. 
um, certainly in terms of sort of continental standards and so you do tend to get little flourishes of or sections of white water even on rivers that are otherwise slack. That said, there are some very nice, gentle, uh, you know, one of the classic ones is the River Wye, and there are campsites along. You know, you can canoe that or you can kayak that. I, you've said kayak, um, whether you mean kayaking exclusively or whether you're just encompassing all paddling. Um, so, you know, you can canoe that in an open canoe or kayak that in a, in a kayak. Um, and of course, if you're, if you're willing to, um, get involved in sea kayaking as well. There's lots of coast and estuaries and things that can be explored uh, as well. I would caveat all of this with getting the relevant uh, introductory instruction wherever you're going. Um, in terms of camping, if you're in, in England and Wales, you've got the same issue uh, as you have anywhere in England and Wales if you want to wild camp in that, strictly speaking, you need to have landowner's permission. Um, there is no wild land as such that you can go and camp on particularly as rivers tend to be in the in the lowlands uh, you know there are some upland areas in england and wales you know lake district peak district um snowdonia where you know upland camping is is tolerated but strictly speaking even that is not legal um it tends to be a little bit more contested lower down you've got people fishing you've got people's homes you've got farms you've got other u land use issues going on down there where you know you camping there might be an issue but there are places um along the way that it, like i say the river y where there are organized campsites and you can camp um what I would recommend you getting is there is a map that you can get um, and I will link to it under under here. I have a copy of it at home and you open it out and it has all of the rivers in, in the UK and it has a colour scheme that shows you you know what sort of water they are, whether they're flat water, whether they're um, more bouncy or whether they're exclusively you know for kayaks or whether you, know, you can go on in a canoe in terms of the grade whether it's you know grade one grade two grade three etc so that's a useful map to, to have I think it's just called something like the canoe and kayak map or, or something along those lines um, I know you can get it on Amazon I'll link to it underneath this um, in Scotland um, so so I'm, I'm rambling on here a little bit um, the map won't necessarily tell you where you can camp, but it will show you where the rivers are, and then you can you can research. You know, you can get on Google and say, okay, what in England and Wales can I can I paddle this and camp? You know, other places I can camp along this river because you know you can't just look at the map and assume you can camp along those. Um, in Scotland, however, um, the law is different with respect to wild camping and you can wild camp as long as you're not imposing on people's privacy and as long as you're not interfering with economic uh, activity, so you know you're not camp damaging farmers crops or something for example. Um, so you've got more leeway and of course on that map again you can see where those rivers are, you can see where the lochs are um, and that will give you a good idea of the places you might be looking at. But what I would also recommend, and I, I, I brought this out because I read, I read through the questions last night briefly while I was preparing them, this book here, Scottish Canoe Touring, that's a really nice book in terms of briefly uh, giving you a, a summary of rivers and locks and routes that you can do so joined up as it were and um, that's the Scottish Canoe Association Canoe and Kayak Guide and it has lots and lots of different routes all over all over Scotland lots of different lots of different areas so I'd recommend getting hold of that book there's there's lots and lots of opportunity for the type of canoe or kayak camping you sound like you want to do in Scotland and as I say if you want to go in England and Wales get hold of that map and then you're going to have to do some research on what the camping restrictions are along a river that might take your fancy. Okay, so I know I didn't give you a specific answer but there's, there's lots of opportunity, you just have to sort of decide where you want to go broadly and then drill down into that. So I would say get the map, get the Scottish Canoe Association uh, canoe touring, canoe and kayak touring um, and you'll be good to go. Bit of research, have a great trip.
and there's lots and lots of people um, that can give you advice like you can get online and have a look at the UK rivers guide that'll give you some um, indication of what what sections of particular rivers are like as well and also get on there is uh, the open canoe association uh, which you could join if you're interested in open uh, canoeing in particular um, they're very helpful in terms of where you can go and they also have you know meetups and, and what have you and then of course um, there are forums like uh, Song of the Paddle for example that you can join and talk to people on there about maybe where to go so there's a link to all of that below and that's all worth looking into and one of the fun things about canoe trips or any type of trip is, is sort of looking at a map and kind of going I'd like to go there I'd like that looks cool there I'd, that looks interesting and then diving in deeper doing research and planning a trip and then executing the trip it's, it's a really nice thing to do from start to finish okay next question banking fires for the next morning this is from Craig Taylor and it's a recording. Hi Paul, it's Craig Taylor here. I hope you keep your mind that you've had a good Christmas. My Ask Paul Kirtley question relates to the subject of, of banking coals or stacking coals, I believe it's also known as. Um, it's a concept, as I'm sure you're familiar with, where you, you stack the coals and embers at the end of the night, at the end of your fire, into a compact pile in the hope that the next morning when you wake up, you can rake apart that that compact pile of, of embers and coals, find a, a hot ember and then use that to hopefully bring some dry kindling or some dry tinder to flame, making it much quicker to, to restart your fire in the morning. I've tried it on a couple of occasions using a combination of pine and hornbeam. And whilst I've got some very, very hot embers at the end of the night, come the next morning, there's absolutely no heat left in them whatsoever. The temperature range was between sort of five and 10 degrees C. There was no significant overnight rain at all. In fact, there was no rain at all overnight, although it was December in the UK. So there was a little bit of, of mist and fog. I don't expect you to give any fault finding on my particular example because clearly you weren't there and there's a lot of variables involved. But I just wondered if you had any general hints, tips or advice on banking coals or stacking coals to increase the likelihood of you being able to get a fire from them the next morning. As always, Paul, a huge, huge thank you for doing these Ask Paul Kirtleys as well as everything else that you put out into the bushcraft community. You're really adding value and I'm sure everybody else appreciates it as well. Cheers, Paul. All right, so, um, yeah, sort of a multifaceted question in some ways from Craig there with respect to how do you get some, make sure you've got some embers in the morning, I think is the, is the summary of it. Um, I think there might be a bit of a misconception there, Craig. I don't know who's told you that you should bank the embers. I would say the best bet is to, is to bank the logs. Um, if you've just got a pile of embers at the end of the night, you're probably not going to have any embers in the morning. If you've got some decent firewood, you mentioned hornbeam and we'll differentiate between some different species. Hornbeam burns quite hot, it's quite calorific, it's quite a hard wood. That's what hornbeam means. It means hard wood, hard tree. Um, and um, you know it burns pretty well it's a good roasting wood you're not going to find it in many places you'll get it where you are because of the part of the world that you're in and there is hornbeam you're not that far from where i'm recording this actually so you will um you will get hornbeam around there more broadly um beech is a good one and oak is a good one um in terms of producing in the first place producing good embers but also in terms of a slower combustion because that's really what you need if you've got some logs you brought them together um you want them to slowly combust um, you want you want wood that is going to be calorific and that is going to burn slowly unless you're really trying to 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 blast it um, you don't want to be bringing fire together in a sort of star fire type of way you want to be bringing logs together where you've got at least two logs in parallel and i'm not necessarily talking about doing a long log fire i'm just talking about you've got multiple um, you haven't just got one touch point where they're going to burn away you've got a touch point where the one log is laying against the other one and even if one of those burns away a bit the other one's going to follow through under the under the action of gravity so that they maintain contact and that there is a burning surface across them that's probably what you need to do having a lot of heat underneath both of those logs in the first place and yes you can start banking earth and 
ash and things on them, but a couple of decent sized logs and you you know beech, um, oak, hornbeam, you know after a good you know warm fire in the evening is probably going to leave you with some embers in the morning. Um, even if it's just blowing on one of those logs and you're getting a little bit of a glow and then having to build it up from um, from there. What I would say though, all that being said is, why do you want to do that? And that, you know, I'm being a bit obtuse, but it's, it's, you know, it's a valid question. Yes, it can be nice to wake up in the morning, go over to your fire site, blow on the embers, introduce a bit of fine kindling and rekindle the fire and have your billy pot or your kettle over those flames in not very long. But equally, you've burnt probably a good part of two logs overnight that could have been good firewood that you're now going to have to replace. And the question is, would it maybe have been more economical to just put aside some materials to light your fire quickly in the morning and not burn that decent firewood that you could then use the following evening for cooking a nice stew, for example, if you've split it down a bit or even just kept it in the round, depending on what you're trying to do. So I'm not saying don't try and do that. I'm just saying think about why you're doing that. Now, the pre one of the previous questions was about being out um, in a sort of survival situation, particularly when you're living off the land, you, your energy levels are going to go down. And if you don't have a, a modern device for lighting a fire, uh, and I would include a flint and steel in that because that's a relatively modern device. Um, if you don't have something and you're resorting to very natural means of fire lighting like bow drill or hand drill, um, as your energy goes down, you, you're less likely to get that to work, and you don't want to be relighting your fire in the morning and relighting your fire in, you know, after going out foraging for the day. You want to bank it and keep it going. So yes, and the way that you do that is by piling up quite a bit of wood, but do it in such a way that it's not going to burn very quickly and use wood that is relatively slow burning. Don't be using softwoods like pine. Pine burns away very quickly. It burns away to nothing. Um, as, as do a lot of the softwoods. Um, and wood such as uh, sweet chestnut, which you have a lot of around where you are, again, um, that burns quite quickly. It's not, uh, it doesn't produce good embers, it just burns down to ash. You will almost certainly have nothing left in the morning if you're using things like pine or sweet chestnut. And as I say, use those other woods like hornbeam, oak, and uh, beech, maybe a bit of a decent sized willow as well. Um, and uh, that, all of those are good. So there's some tips for you. But again, just go right back to first principles and think about, do I need to do this? Because there are these little tropes in, in bushcraft and I've noticed them particularly, you know, you get them echoed across um, different YouTube accounts where people almost copy each other or things become vogue that we're gonna do this. We're gonna, you know, you see certain types of pot hanger or tarp arrangements appearing in lots of different places on Instagram and you see it the same with, all right, I'm gonna bank my fire and okay, fair enough. There might be very valid reasons for doing that, but equally you might wanna save the firewood for the next day. And sometimes what we do in our camp is at the end of the day, when we're finished with the fire, we actually spread the logs so that they burn out without consuming as a f and then we bring them back into the fire in the morning so we'll you know have some kindling spark onto a bit of birch bark twigs bring in the bigger logs that they're all scorched on the end they will they will light very easily um, and then you've got your fire again without having to go and find more firewood that's another option so there we are Cat tourniquets. This is a question via Instagram. This is from Jim. Nice picture of an orange cat tourniquet there. And he says, my first aid course taught the use of combat application tourniquet. And I've seen it in your kit. Uh, sorry, I'll read that again. Um, my first aid course taught the use of the combat application tourniquet and I haven't seen it in your kit list. What's your view on this device? The course was wilderness one, but included first aid at work and forestry. Is this a bad idea in remote areas when extraction and swift medical attention may not be forthcoming? Well, I don't know what they told you on that course, Jim, um, with regards to how to use those tourniquets. And if they've, if they've taught you properly, pro properly, they should um, have told you that you can now use tourniquets 
um, and use them and as long as you release them with the correct protocols which I am not going to go into now yeah if you want to learn how to use them if you're watching this and you don't know how to use them go on a course that teaches you how to use them so I'm not going to be specific about how to use them because this isn't a first aid course it's out of context um, and I don't want people going away thinking that they know how to use them based on what I've said okay but the thing I will say is that when I first did first aid courses back in the day the advice was don't use tourniquets tourniquets are bad if you put a tourniquet on your leg will go black and it'll drop off um, <laughs> that was kind of the attitude um, whereas now um, it, it then kind of moved to yeah but only only if you're a soldier in Iraq or Afghanistan but now it's kind of moved the 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 experience of using tourniquets in those places um, has caused a change to filter down into more general outdoor first day training and I will say I've for many 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 years carried a, a cat tourniquet in my personal kit and in particular when I'm on my own in the woods using an axe or if I'm I don't use machetes or prangs very often I don't tend to do a lot of stuff in tropical areas um, but there's a couple of things I, I carry when I'm carrying larger cutting tools and and I carry this on my person one is a large bandage an Israeli type bandage that has got the ability to tighten it up quite tight and I also carry a cat tourniquet if I'm doing a canoe trip on my own if I'm doing a, uh, a hike maybe not so much I'll have the bandage I might not have the tourniquet but generally I've got those things with me um, if I'm using cutting tools under any circumstances in wild places where help is not at hand I will have those if I am on a solo journey particularly if I'm in a, in a canoe because I tend to be using a cutting tool more on canoe trips than on hiking trips for example um, and if I'm just here on my own, you know, I'm not far away from help, but I'm far enough away from help that if I put an ax in my leg, it could be pretty serious. Um, and so, yes, I've carried those for a long time, but it was contra to what we were being told on first aid courses for, for quite a while, but now it's come on to first aid courses. And yes, um, I do have them in my kit. Um, we do have them in our, um, uh, group kits and we certainly have them in our expedition kits and so yes if you've been taught to use them and use them properly with the right protocols uh, under what circumstances and how long you can leave them on for and marking them with times and all of those things then yes have them in your kit I think they're a very useful thing and particularly if you're on your own using a larger cutting tool where you can do yourself a major damage as it were um, and you could have a serious bleed having one of them on your person I think is uh, very sensible because I mean the other thing as much as anything it's not just about the blood loss it's also about remaining functional if you're in a wild place you if you have to cut off a lot of blood loss um, it's going to be hard to do it on your own but you know if I put an axe in my lower leg I want to be able to put a tourniquet on above it and um, make sure that um, that I limit the blood loss uh, even if that's just to stop myself passing out so I can get on the sat phone for example um, so yes without going into teaching people how to use them um, because frankly that's not what I do um, you know we do cover that on one of our courses and um, which I do jointly with the guy who does our first day training and um, so I would say if you want to learn how to use tourniquets um, learn it on a on a relevant outdoor course as you have done Jim and I would yet yeah, recommend that they're in your kit for large cutting tool use even relatively close to home as well as um, going into wild places especially if you're on your own but also in your group kit they're a good thing to have and also you showed an orange one get the orange ones and um, you know people like to get all tactical and buy the black ones orange ones are better because if you put them on somebody else you can see where they are the black one tends to bl blend in with with dark clothing we all like to wear green and blacks and dark browns and things and so the orange ones are much easier to see um, yeah 
hopefully that answers your question, Jim, without me giving any sort of partial advice on how to use them to anybody else. And that's not me being a knob, by the way, that's just me saying go and get some proper training if you want to use, you want to carry and use these things. Okay, question from Davey. Um, this is about bow drill standing up. Davey at Buzzard Bushcraft, and he says, Hi Paul, um, with reference to your uh, episodes regarding fire by friction. I used to be very good at getting a fire going with this method with materials I was finding when I was out but now I have arthritis in both knees and other joints and find it very painful to get into a comfortable position to practice this method. Um, together with my pal Phil we can get an ember easily but I am wanting to get back to getting this myself. Is there any other way or position that you could recommend to get me back into getting my skill up to a level that I was once at. Is there a method that I could use standing up, for, ex for example? Um, thanks in advance for your answer, and as always, your videos are informative and enjoyable to watch. Davy at Buzzard Bushcraft. Um, well, yeah, you can do it standing up, but you have to bring you have to bring the set up to your level, as it were, and, you know, so if you can find a stump, like, like you know, I'm sitting on a tree stump at the moment from some forestry a while ago where they've taken out some of the, the spruce trees in this area, they've thinned out these woods. If you can find a stump that you can then put the set on, put your, put your foot on, which doesn't mean then that you're kneeling right down on the ground and, you know, hunched over. Yeah, sure, do that. Um, equally, you know, if you can find a fallen tree, like the, there's one over there that I, I sometimes sit on to do these um, episodes. Again, if you can get a, a bow drill set, the, the hearthboard balanced on that with your leg up, with the other leg straight, and then you can still bear down on it. I've seen people do it that way as well, and that can work very nicely. Um, so I would experiment with bringing the set up to a level where you're less hunched over, that one of your leg is, excuse me, one of your legs is more or less straight and uh, where your other leg is up sort of at right angles to your to your chest and that you can step on something like you're stepping up onto a high step and then you can lean forward onto it from there those that that's that's the main thing i can think of Sh short of building really oversized sets you know which we we've done in the past with for group kind of activities and team building where you build absolutely <laughs> massive bow drill sets you know big spindle you know big half board like a you know plank uh, like a scaffolding plank sort of size and then a big bearing block on top and you need about five people to make it work um of course a lot of everyone's pretty much standing up but you want to do it on your own so you're going to have to keep the scale of the set normal and be able to do that on your own i would say yeah find a surface in if you're out in the woods fallen tree big log that you can get a set on and then work on work on that at that level rather than hunching right right down i would say have a play with that i've, I've certainly seen people do that um and it'd be quite fruitful you still need to get the pressure on um, by bearing down on it though um, and that that's about so don't get it too high because otherwise you'll end up sort of leaning back rather than being able to lean into it a bit and that is that that brings us to the end of episode 70 70 of the Aspore Kirtley and we will be into the 70s now 71 will be the next episode I was born in the 70s so it's a good decade it's a good decade to be in um, not a lot to really tell you about what's going on at the moment just getting back into the UK courses now um, springtime is just about here and looking forward to seeing some of you on courses before too long and if you're interested in any of the courses that we do, you know the score, frontierbushcraft.com uh, forward slash courses. Those are our field courses. You can find them all there. There are places left on some of the courses this summer. Um, not all of them, quite a few of them are fully booked, but um, some of the basic bushcraft courses actually still have places on them. And so if you're looking to come and get some really good solid skills uh, with a good group of instructors, then please check those out. And um, also got a few new courses there as well so even the old hands can have a look and see if there's something new to take your fancy this year or in the future. Um, 
I will maybe be changing things up a bit again next year. So if there's a particular course that you're looking at um, and the space is on it this year, I would get on it um, because I'm change. I'm looking at changing proportion and the way that we do certain things. Just you know, I've been doing this a long time now, and things change over time in terms of what people want, and we can see that in terms of what people are booking, what people are not booking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, yeah, we listen to we listen to what people want in terms of the type of training and we try and deliver that. So yeah, if there are things there that have got spaces and you fancy that, if you can get on it this year, I would if I were you, particularly if it's with me personally, um, because again, I, my time is getting split between lots of things these days, um, more wilderness trips, um, people keep asking me for more, more videos, more films, more stuff. Clearly, if I'm gonna teach that way um, using videos um, then my time for teaching a few people in the woods goes down as well so I've got to kind of sum up what's the best thing for me to do how should I be spending my time and um, there may be a few changes in how I allocate my time after 2018 in particular so yeah I would uh, those courses won't always be there that that's a way to think about it yeah I, some of those some of the type of courses that I run, I've been running for 15 years now uh, in one way or another um, under my own auspices or, or previous uh, employers. And um, yeah, sometimes uh, you need to step back and look at what you're doing and think, OK, that's that's a way of having more impact or people aren't getting that type of training. There's lots of opportunities for that type of training, but there's not so, lot, not so much opportunity for that type of training. Um, so we have to listen keep our ears to the ground and see what people want and how uh, we can have the biggest impact in terms of getting skills and knowledge across to people. So anyway, have a look at our courses, see what takes your fancy. There's some new stuff there already and uh, jump on uh, a, a relevant program because there's lots of good stuff there. And I'm partnering up with some really good people as well um, in ways that they're not, uh, those, those combinations of trainings those intersections of skill sets are not available elsewhere so have a look at those um, bit of a hard sell but equally um, this is how I make my living I don't make my living by making us Paul Kirtley videos um, I make us Paul Kirtley videos to try and help as many people as possible but equally I've got to let people know um, about the other stuff as well from time to time so uh, please forgive me for doing that if you're not interested at all um, in any of the and I know a lot of you are around the world and I know some of you would like to come and do things with me but um, you know yeah the travel is difficult I appreciate that but I appreciate you watching these videos and I appreciate you asking the questions please keep the questions coming and um, I have now managed to get through pretty much all of the backlog of, uh, of uh, questions um, that had built up over the winter there aren't a lot outstanding at the moment and um, yeah, if you want me to keep making these shows, keep the questions coming in, that's what they're for. Uh, I'm not gonna make them for the sake of it, but keep the questions coming in. All right, take care, see you on the next one, bye-bye.